So these fall in the category, these slow-acting chronic agents in the broad category of uh, non-lethal biologic warfare agents. And why do we put them in that category? Well, we put them in that category because several nations, including the, the U.S. and other nations, have developed these as chronic biological warfare agents. So I'm not putting these on the list because we think they're agents that are developed for uh, WMD. We know they are. In other words, they were researched, developed, and in some case stockpiled as biologic agents. So if we look down the list, uh, brucella, brucellosis, tularemia, acute fever, mycoplasma, it's actually on the list, along with some other things, as one of the incapacitating agents developed as a biologic warfare agent. Let me introduce to you Dr. Garth Nicholson, scientist, friend and human, humanist. Dr. Nicholson, we're pleased to have you here. Today I'm going to uh, talk uh, about emerging infections and their role in a variety of different chronic illnesses. And the reason we call these emerging infections is because there was little evidence that these infections caused significant uh, disease, at least significant numbers of, of patients uh, with illness uh, some 20, 25 years ago. So these are illnesses within the last 25 years that have really taken off. Now, most of you have noticed that there's a tremendous increase in chronic illnesses, everything from the fatiguing illnesses, which I'll talk more about uh, today and how we got involved in that, but also autoimmune illnesses, uh, neurodegenerative diseases, which I spoke on uh, in my last trip to, to Sudbury in the conference, uh, and neurobehavioral illnesses, uh, which uh, Don briefly mentioned our work on autistic spectrum disorders. These illnesses, uh, I feel, are increasing in incidence because of chronic infections. And that seems to be what ties it all in. And I'll make my case for that in just a moment. So my hypothesis for this lecture is that the emergence of uh, new illnesses and the increase in incidence rates of those that uh, have been described previously are due to our increasing toxic environment. So there's also uh, a role here of, of environment. And this has to do with our immune system and our endocrine system, and also the purposeful development and testing of new weapons of mass destruction. And so this is how we tie this in with some of the other talks uh, here at Sudbury. Because some of the infections that we found, uh, both in civilians and, and within the military, uh, have more to do with the development of new biologic agents than they have to do with the natural emergence of infectious diseases. So what kinds of things are we talking about? Well, you've all heard of bacteria and viruses. Uh, you might not have, and probably have heard of, in this context of this meeting, heard of small bacterial microorganisms called mycoplasmas, and I'm gonna talk more about them because they're, they're one of the emerging infections that happen to be involved in a variety of different chronic illnesses. But, they're not the only thing out there. I'm just concentrating on that because we've happened to have done a lot of uh, research in that area. So chronic infections are often misdiagnosed or not even sought, and because of this, infections are either untreated or inappropriately treated. The, the fact that your GP, your general practitioner, really doesn't know much about these infections. And the reason he doesn't know about these infections is they're really not discussed in medical school any longer. They were 25 years ago, but they're not even taught now. And I know this because I, I taught in medical schools at the University of California and the University of Texas for over 25 years, so I know the curriculum quite well. And these are things which are really not discussed. And you might wonder, why is this if we feel that they might be involved in a variety of different diseases? So what kind of diseases are we talking about? Well, we now know that chronic infections play a very important role in a variety of different diseases. Now, last, uh, the last conference I spoke, I talked about neurodegenerative diseases, and you've heard of uh, many of these. Uh, they used to be very rare, things like Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. You know, some 30 years ago, this was a very rare disease, and now it's not so uncommon. 
as I'll tell you in a moment. And neurobehavioral disorders are going through the roof. Things like autistic spectrum disorders, autism, Asperger's syndrome, attention deficit disorder, and so on, mainly in the young. And the incidence rate is absolutely through the roof uh, on these. And I'll come back to that at the end of my talk. Fatiguing illnesses, including Gulf War illness, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia syndrome, and, and other such illnesses. These were literally unheard of 20, 25 years ago. Hardly anyone knew about these diseases, and for the most part, they were ill-described back in those days. Autoimmune diseases, um, now very common. Rheumatoid arthritis, for example, is a very common disease now. It wasn't 25 years ago. Gastrointestinal disorders, genital urinary diseases, immunosuppressive diseases, all these have in common the very important role of chronic infections. And this is not always, by the way, acknowledged by the medical community. So what do we know about this? But the majority of chronic illness patients uh, show evidence of chronic infections, and I'll show you some data on that, actually. Viral, bacterial, fungal. In fact, most chronic illness patients have multiple infections. So they have multiple bacterial, viral, and even fungal infections. And those of you that have come to talk to me have told me some of your problems, and it's clear that you have multiple infections. Now, patients that have these infections benefit from treatment of the infections. Well, if the medical community doesn't acknowledge that these infections are important, you're not going to get treatment through the conventional uh, medical uh, services. They just aren't going to help you with these, so you have to help yourself. Now, many chronic illness patients recover from their illnesses after long-term uh, treatment of their chronic infections. So these can be uh, antibiotics, antiviral, antifungal, whatever, depending upon what the infections are. But uh, those treatments are absolutely necessary for many of these infections because if they're not treated, you won't recover. And so the last point here is if these patients are not treated, they don't recover. So they remain perpetually in chronic illness states. And this is what we've seen in our population. We've seen people become chronically ill, and they're chronically ill for the rest of their lives. Now, the major pharmaceutical companies love this. Why do they love this? Well, for the next 20, 30 years or whatever, they have uh, people that are willing to buy their products, uh, which uh, for the most part are palliative. That is, they can suppress the signs and symptoms, but they don't really go after the underlying problem. And again, they love that because that, that means they've got customers for life. So they're going to make billions and billions of dollars off of all these chronic illnesses. So they're getting involved in all these chronic illnesses. And they have all kinds of different uh, drugs and everything. But unfortunately, uh, very few of them really do anything to directly treat the illness. They just simply mask the signs and symptoms, make you feel better, get you back to work, and so on and so forth. They make you totally dependent upon the drug companies to maintain that level of lifestyle. So what I'm going to tell you this morning is that uh, a lot of patients have these chronic infections. And what are we talking about? Well, over here on the left are a list of some of the bacteria and then some of the viruses on the right. And I haven't bothered to list the fungal infections. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, mycoplasma, but that's not the only one that is a problem. In fact, um, down lower on the list, Borrelia, uh, if I were to make the list now, I'd put that up higher on, on the list because now it's becoming an increasingly important problem. Borrelia burgdorferi is the, one of the organisms involved in Lyme disease. Now, Lyme disease is a very complex disease, and there are at least a half a dozen different infections that are involved in, in Lyme disease. So it's not as simple as most people think, and its treatment is not simple either. But there are also various viruses that are, that are involved as well. I'm going to talk primarily about the intracellular bacterial infections. So these are bacteria that get inside our cells, and when they get inside, they hide from the immune system. And that means it's very difficult for our immune systems to, to tackle the, the problem of, of these types of infections. The other problem is when they're inside the cells, they can interfere with uh, various aspects of the cell machinery, the metabolism of the cell, the energy generation systems in the cell, uh, even the divisions of the cells, the nuclear material in the cell. So we know that these types of infections are associated with multiple signs and symptoms, the first point here. 
that means that any given infection can cause a variety of nonspecific signs and symptoms. And what do I mean by that? Nonspecific meaning that you cannot pin down your signs and symptoms to a particular infection because uh, the signs and symptoms are nonspecific. So they could be anything from headache, neurologic problems like short-term memory loss or brain fog, uh, aching joints, for example, intermittent fevers, low-grade fevers, skin rashes, gastrointestinal problems, even coronary problems, uh, all kinds of different situations. So these types of infections often interfere with the endocrine system. They throw our hormones all the whack, and so there are all kinds of endocrine-related disorders. They cause vasculitis. They uh, cause inflammation of the vascular system, so people can have uh, coronary disease, cardiovascular disease, uh, very common, for example, in our Gulf War veterans that have had these infections, and all kinds of different problems. But again, nothing that you could specifically say was due to a specific infection. In other words, a polio virus causing polio, that's out of the question. These are a lot different. So if we just look at mycoplasmal infections, just small, uh, very tiny pleomorphic bacteria that doesn't really have a cell wall and it gets inside our cells and causes havoc with our metabolism and other aspects of, of the cell. If we just look at a number of diseases, we find this all over the place. For example, in chronic fatigue syndrome, 50 to 60 percent of patients have this infection. It's probably much higher than that, but the tests are not easy for this type of microorganism. Autism spectrum disorders, uh, different studies that we've done, different parts of the country in, in the U.S., uh, 58 to 65 percent, fibromyalgia syndrome, up to 65 percent, rheumatoid arthritis, about half the patients, Lyme disease, up to 65 percent have this as a co-infection with the Lyme Borrelia. And we come down to other diseases like uh, ALS, for example, up to 90 percent of patients have this infection. So we know that in, in some of these diseases, like ALS, which is increasing very high rate of increase in its incidence, virtually every patient has this type of infection. So we, we know it's important. So how did we find these? And how did we get involved in this in the first place? And this goes back to the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, uh, because my, uh, my stepdaughter fought in the Gulf War with the 101st Airborne Division and came back and she and her colleagues slowly started getting sick. And in her case, uh, she was training to be a pilot when the, when the war broke out. And uh, when she got back, she couldn't complete her flight training. She flunked her flight physical. So she eventually left the, uh, the Army. And now and then she went on to medical school and is now a neurologist. So it worked out well for her, but uh, with our help, she overcame her illness. And there were a lot of people who didn't and who were still in the dark about this. But we started studying veterans, and we started first with the Airborne and Special Forces units because we had access to to those patients, we had good communications there, and this spread to, uh, to other units as well where there was heavy involvement. And eventually some of our studies became uh, multinational. We, we ran our ALS study, we used British, American, Canadian, and two Australian veterans. So we had a wide net there, so we were pretty, pretty sure that what we found was true of all the, the veterans that served, that received uh, the military vaccines. We also started studying the families uh, of these veterans because the families started to get sick after the veterans returned home. And that <coughs> is another study which I'll discuss, but you've heard probably that uh, military service, uh, particularly in the Gulf Wars, was uh, linked to an increase in Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Now, there were a number of uh, toxic exposures that happened uh, during the first Gulf War and even the second Gulf War. And in fact, we don't find infections in, in all the, the uh, veterans who were sick. We find it about half. So there were other things there. There were chemicals, uh, some radiologic exposures, environmental exposures, and of course, biologic exposures. But we concentrated mainly on the biologic exposures because we started studying the family members. And if you have an illness that passes to a family member, it can't be radiological or chemical, for example. It has to be biological. And this goes back to the old versus new thinking about chronic illnesses. I mentioned that we're not dealing with just one event here. 
such as uh, infection A going to disease A, polio, polio virus causing polio. We're talking about a variety of these different infections, chronic infections, together with different uh, immune competency states of the patients, different genetic backgrounds, different toxic environments, different heavy metals, for example, getting together and causing a complex situation, which we call a syndrome. And the reason we call a syndrome is because it's not tightly knit signs and symptoms. They're very broad, very nonspecific, and so on. So and we have to call it a syndrome. They're really diseases, but we call them syndromes. So in the case of the Gulf War, these were delayed casualties. Hardly anyone uh, was sick uh, actually during the conflict. Mostly they came down with illness within six months to a year and a half after they returned uh, from deployment. So these fall in the category, these uh, slow-acting chronic agents in the broad category of uh, non-lethal biologic warfare agents. And why do we put them in that category? Well, we put them in that category because several nations, including the, the U.S. and other nations, have developed these as chronic biological warfare agents. So I'm not putting these on the list because we think they're agents that are developed for uh, WMD. We know they are. In other words, they were researched, developed, and in some cases stockpiled as biologic agents. So if we look down the list, uh, brucella, brucellosis, tularemia, acute fever, mycoplasma, it's actually on the list, along with some other things, as one of the incapacitating agents developed as a biologic warfare agent. Now, the Iraqis admitted uh, that they'd been developing germ warfare agents, but they really didn't find any of these agents in, uh, after the war, so they said. But actually, that's not true. They did find them. And the reason we heard contrary information about that is because some of these agents were fully deployed on the front lines. And they didn't want to talk about it so much had, because it really had to do more with the origin of these agents rather than their use. Where did they come from originally? And in fact, uh, many of them came from uh, the United States arsenals supplied to the Iraqis during the Iran-Iraq war to use against uh, the Iranians. And guess what? They got used against our forces during the war. But this wasn't the major source, we think, of infections like the mycoplasma. And when I testified to Congress, I've done that six times, not that they really really had any impact, but at least we were there and put it on the record. The number one source we felt for these illnesses were the microbes that they received as contaminants in the vaccines. Now, most military personnel who were deployed received between 20 and 30 uh, vaccines, generally within a two to three day period during deployment, which is very very wrong to do this. It's a very immunosuppressive to give all those vaccinations uh, within a short period of time. It just immunosuppresses the patient, or in this case, uh, the subject, and makes them very susceptible uh, to either super infection or even if there's a contaminant, infection by the contaminant. And this is the link we feel with um, autistic spectrum disorders, which I'll come back to, the vaccines. And you've probably heard about Camasia, one of the biggest uh, demolition sites immediately after the war, where literally thousands of tons of munitions were blown up by our engineering units. And <clears throat> virtually everyone in those units came down with illness uh, within months uh, after that. And we, we helped some of them. Now, we know that uh, weapons, biologic weapons, were in those bunkers. Why do we know that? Because some of the engineers had their own videotape and took their own uh, video cameras down in the bunkers and started filming the munitions. So this is one of the reasons why you haven't heard a lot about, uh, about this story, is that it's, uh, it's got a very bad origin. Now, the multiple vaccines were a real problem during the Gulf War, and this is why people who weren't even in the, near the, the conflict, what were deployed to the, what was called the Kuwaiti Theater of Operations, came down with illness. So we had sailors on ships that were in the Gulf that were nowhere near the conflict. We had other forces that were never sent ashore. We had Marines on ships 
in a feint to uh, confuse the Iraqis uh, that, that they were going to be deployed in a landing operation. A lot of these people came down sick as well, and we have to trace it back to the multiple vaccines. Now, there, there are four different epidemiological studies published in the literature which trace Gulf War illnesses back to the vaccines. Um, and I've just mentioned two of these. One, a British study published in, in Lancet that the multiple vaccines were associated with Gulf War illnesses in, in British veterans. And another study, which I thought was very interesting, published by the Kansas State Department of Epidemiology by Leah Steele. And they studied Kansas veterans of the Gulf War and all the different services and found that 34% of the deployed forces who received multiple vaccines came down with illness uh, after the war. These non-specific illnesses we call Gulf War illnesses. Now, those that were vaccinated and weren't deployed because the war ended so quickly, 12% of those end up with illness as well, compared to 4% of the non-deployed, non-vaccinated uh, forces that had non-specific signs and symptoms. So there you can see a clear relationship between vaccination, whether you were deployed or not, and illness. Now, one of the things which is interesting on it, because I asked her about um, some of the forces that were deployed so quickly they couldn't be immunized and there were some units that were deployed very quickly and again the illness rate was very low in those units so you could even be deployed as long as you weren't vaccinated and have a low incidence of illness but if you were vaccinated whether you were deployed or not the rate of illness was significantly higher so it really chases it down now we published a paper a number of years ago on mycoplasmal infections in amyotropic lateral sclerosis. And in there, we found that 100% of the Gulf War veterans, and I mentioned we had uh, British, American, Canadian, and Australian veterans, every one of them had a mycoplasmal infection. And almost all of these were one species of mycoplasma, mycoplasma fermentans, and I'll get back to that particular species. If we look at civilians with ALS, we also see that a very high frequency of those patients have bacterial and viral infections, and most of them have mycoplasmal infections. In fact, almost all of them, 80, 85% or more, have mycoplasma as an, a chronic systemic infection. Now, in, in civilians, they often also have a virus called an ECHO7 enterovirus. Now, the, the difference between some of these infections and the ECHO7 virus and the mycoplasma is that the latter invade the central nervous system. So we feel that they're directly involved in the development of ALS, which ALS is really happens when these infections get in the uh, midbrain, in the motor neural part of the midbrain, and start killing the motor neurons. And eventually they die and eventually uh, you become paralyzed uh, from it and lose uh, function, for example, breathing function, swallowing function, so on. Now, in Gulf War veterans with ALS, as I mentioned, 100% of them had uh, mycoplasmal infections, and almost all of them, except two, had mycoplasma fermentans infections. So what is it about this one species of mycoplasma? And we'll be touching upon that. Now, in the civilians, we didn't see that scenario. They had a number of different species. Uh, obviously, mycoplasma fermentans was one of the highest in frequency, but we also found uh, hominis, for example. And in fact, if you take European ALS patients, the frequency of mycoplasma hominis is much higher than any other species in European ALS patients. And here in the United States, North America, Canadian American, it's a uh, mycoplasma fermentan. So there is a difference, a regional difference in the different species. Now the reason we were so interested in mycoplasma fermentans is that there's actually a patent that was issued on this and uh, Don Scott may have talked about this. This patent was issued to a pathologist that worked for the US Army, Chai Ching Lo, who's a mycoplasma expert and he was at Fort Detrick before he went to the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology, but he's probably published more on, on pathogenic forms of mycoplasma than any other scientist in the world. He's considered the world, the world expert. Originally, he was from uh, communist China. He came defected to, to the United States and became a scientist in our 
biological warfare program. Now, interestingly enough, Chai Ching Lo denies that uh, mycoplasma is involved in Gulf War illness patients, even though we know that 40 to 50 percent of those patients have this infection, and that's been confirmed in four different laboratories around the U.S. And he still uh, kind of denies it, but unfortunately he doesn't really publish anything on his studies except for one little brief note using a totally inadequate technique, an antibody technique to look for mycoplasmal infections. And we know that that's not the way you find these infections, so they, he purposely chose a technique which was inadequate to show that they weren't there. Now, chronic infections such as mycoplasma and other infections are found in a variety of different uh, diseases such as neurodegenerative diseases, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because I, I really went into a full-blown lecture one of the previous conferences here about this, but Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson, I mentioned uh, ALS, and multiple sclerosis. All these have very high incidence of these types of infections, but again, multiple infections in these different patients for the most part. Now, the reason that these intracellular infections are so insidious is the following, and I've just used an example here, mycoplasma. First is they get inside the cell, so they're kind of sequestered away from the immune system. When they're inside the cell, they interfere with the metabolism of the cell. For example, they attack the little batteries inside our cells, the mitochondria, shown down here at the bottom. And they stimulate the mitochondria to produce what, what are called ROS, or reactive oxygen species, which damage the cell, they damage the membranes of the cells in particular. And the mitochondria production of, of these ROS causes damage to the membrane, they become leaky, and then they can't perform their function. These are the little batteries inside our cells, and so if you can think of what happens when you damage the insulation of a battery, let's say you strip off some of the insulation of a battery, what happens? Well, they run down very quickly, and then they're no good. They don't really have an electrical charge anymore that they generate, and so you have a useless uh, battery. Well, the same thing happens inside your cells when the membrane is attacked. It's like stripping the insulation off the battery. The mitochondria can't function normally, and so they're operating generally at 40% or less capacity inside chronically ill patients. And this has to do with a number of different patients, not just patients, for example, with chronic fatigue syndrome, but across the board. Neurodegenerative diseases, autoimmune diseases, fatiguing illnesses, neurobehavioral diseases, all these diseases have mitochondrial function impairment. And at the end of my talk, I'll show you one of the things that we're doing to try and help reverse this. So these infections, like uh, the mycoplasma, um, also compete for metabolites. They steal metabolites because they're very simple organisms. They can't make a lot of things themselves, so they steal it from the cell. So they rob the cell of certain critical lipids and other metabolites that the cell needs for its uh, structures and function. And I mentioned the alteration of cellular structures, such as the membrane of the cell is altered because uh, the membrane lipids are damaged. They can't function as well. And interestingly, when these types of microorganisms are released from cells, because they don't have a rigid cell wall like a normal bacteria, they take a little piece of the membrane with it, shown here in red, they take a little piece of the host membrane with them when they exit the cell. Now because of that, they actually have the capacity to set up an autoimmune response from the host because they are actually carrying host antigens. This is what's called a concomitant immune response. The host responds against the microorganism and it sees these self-antigens as part of the invasion process, so it responds against them as well. Only what happens is when they respond against the self antigens on the mycoplasma, the response is also against the cells where the mycoplasma came from. So this is how an autoimmune response occurs, one of the, the reasons for triggering. Also, some of the structures on the mycoplasma mimic the host antigens. It's one of the mechanisms that the mycoplasma uses to escape the immune system. So we have um, antigen mimicry as well. And there's some other things going on as well, these types of infections can actually suppress the immune system. So many people that have these infections 
their immune systems are compromised, and so that leaves them wide open for a variety of other opportunistic infections. So often we find in these patients they, they have multiple infections, not all the from the original infectious process, but these are infections that they accumulate, they pick up with time. Now let's go back to the Gulf War, because I mentioned that we know that illnesses were spread to family members, so we could document that, and we could see what kinds of things were transferred from a, a veteran to a family member. In the case of the family members, only the infections are, are what were probably transmitted to the spouses and children. Now how do we prove that? Well, we found uh, that the illnesses in the families were related to infection by the same type of microorganism that we found in the Gulf War veterans. For example, we found that 40% uh, or more of the Gulf War veterans uh, had mycoplasmal infections, and ironically, the, this 40% contributed overwhelmingly to the families that came down with similar illnesses. So if you were infected, then you had the chance to spread that infectious process to your family members. And those family members came down at a very high rate, and that's shown here, the third bar down. The uh, adult family members uh, came down with mycoplasmal infections, and the children did as well. So this just tells you some of the percentages. We studied 110 uh, Gulf War illness patients. More than 80% of them had one infection, mycoplasma fermentans. And this is completely unusual compared to the civilian situation. We studied 100, 149 family members of these veterans, and we found that uh, 40 out of 57 of the adults were mycoplasma positive who were sick, and 26 out of 35 of the children who were, were sick all had the same mycoplasmal infection. 80 to 90 percent or more of the patients who were sick had the same infection as the veteran. Normally, you, you find this in about uh, 4 to 5 percent of the population as a subclinical infection or patients who are, will develop a full-blown infection later on. Now, I mentioned the Gulf War illness patients. More than 80 percent of them had the one species, Mycoplasma fermentans, and of the several that we tested for, hardly any of them had multiple infections. But in, in the civilian population, you see a completely different picture. Multiple infections are the normal. Over half the patients had multiple mycoplasmal infections. Now in the family members, adults who came down with chronic fatigue syndrome, usually spouses, more than 90% of them had one infection, mycoplasma fermentans. So this traces back not only the timing, but the species of infection to the Gulf War veterans. So we're pretty sure what happened there. Same thing with the uh, children who came down with autistic spectrum disorders. A very high percent of them had just the one species of infection. So these were all patients who were asymptomatic before the Gulf War veteran came back to the family member, family unit, and then uh, slowly people started to get sick in the families. And when they got sick, they had the same infection as the Gulf War veteran. So we feel that uh, the infection was a contributor to their illness. So we know in the case of Gulf War illnesses, uh, the vaccines, the chemical agents, in some cases the anti-nerve agents, contributed to the illness. Now how about in civilian families that have very high incidence of autism? Well, that's where we find uh, similar types of infections. Not exactly the same that we found in the Gulf War families, but very similar types of infections. So this is an important aspect of that, and I'm working with some of the autism support groups and uh, clinical organizations that deal with autism, deal with this problem of, of the fact that in autistic spectrum disorders, there's a very high frequency of infections like mycoplasmal infections. Now, autism spectrum disorders, there are several different types of syndromes and diseases that fall under this broad category. Uh, I mentioned attention deficit disorder, but there's uh, ADHD, Asperger's, autism, and other types of illnesses and syndromes as well. The common thread of, of these are that these are developmental disorders that cause social, behavioral, and educational problems, communication problems, repetitive behavior, inability of a child to relate to other human beings, and so on. 
And depending upon the severity and depending upon different aspects of that, you can get a different diagnosis. But we found that uh, a lot of that may depend upon other factors as well. So it's a very complicated process. Now, we, we studied in the civilian population in California autism spectrum disorders. I'm just going to just briefly mention this just because I brought it up. And we found that the majority of uh, patients uh, had uh, mycoplasmal infections. Uh, in this study of 68 ASD patients, 58% were mycoplasma positive. By the way, the most common species was mycoplasma pneumoniae in that group. We studied chlamydia pneumoniae, which is another intracellular bacterial infection. And we found that um, about 8% were positive for this type of infection. And we found about 29% also had a virus, HHV6. So again, these are complex diseases with multiple viral and bacterial infections. And that was the publication in the Journal of Neurosciences Research in 2007. Now I want to back up a little bit and talk about what happened before the Gulf War, because what, what's the origin of all of this? Where did, this, where did these infections come from? Because we didn't hear very much about things like mycoplasmal infections before the Gulf War. But in fact, there was a program going on in Texas in the prison system where they were actually testing these microorganisms under army contracts and pharmaceutical company contracts to test their pathogenicity and test countermeasures against them. And this primarily took place in the early 1980s to late 1980s, so it was well before the, the Gulf War. And this resulted in an increase in infections, not only in fatiguing illnesses, but I just put up here uh, rates in Huntsville, which is one of the towns in which one of these prisons was located, the Huntsville uh, State uh, Correctional Facility. And the, the primary source of employment of the town is the prison, the two prisons. So this is a real prison town. It's kind of isolated. And a very high rate of illness in the town. And for example, the number of ALS patients, uh, and these are incomplete. I just took this from some of the records at the time. There were 28 cases of uh, ALS in this one little town, about 25,000. Well, this is, ALS uh, normally has a, uh, had an incident rate in the civilian population of one in 100,000. So you can see that this is way, way above her. And in fact, before they started working in the prison system with uh, these uh, uh, scientific protocols, uh, there was really no evidence of ALS. So if you go back in the records, it, there was a spike in ALS that happened in the 80s and about a 9,300% increase in ALS patients there. But the same thing was true with uh, multiple sclerosis. There were 68 multiple sclerosis patients. Again, that's uh, only a, a partial 5,000% uh, increase in multiple sclerosis and almost a 2,000% increase in rheumatoid arthritis. And the list goes on and on and on uh, with these increases in illnesses due, we think, to experimentation in the prison system. Now, the interesting thing about these patients, and we, we studied a few of these patients, is that um, the overwhelming majority of these patients had one infection, the mycoplasma fermentans. We go back to the same infection that we found in the Gulf War veterans, only this was before the Gulf War. And it corresponded to the experiments that were being conducted in the prison system. And how do we know there were experiments being conducted in the prison system? Well, there were three uh, brave moms, the three Texas moms, as I call them in, in my book, Project Daylily, which uh, my wife and I wrote about this whole story. These three moms uh, really uncovered uh, the prison experiments, even though they tried to hide these. In fact, they went throughout the state trying to find information, and eventually they uncovered in a dusty uh, storehouse in Austin a copy of the experimental protocols that they were using in the prison system and the, the minutes from the prison board meetings approving these experiments in the prison system. And they had managed to destroy uh, six of the other copies. So there were no copies around, but they forgot about this one copy in this storehouse in Texas. And these three moms found this copy and all the evidence that they tried to hide and destroy that they were conducting these experiments in the prison system. Almost all the patients that we looked at from Huntsville who were 
related to the prison system. And these were not prisoners, these were guards and their family members because the infection spread to the guards, spread to the prison employees in the infirmaries, for example, and spread to their family members in, in Huntsville. And almost all of these patients had the mycoplasma fermentans infections. So again, this looked more like the Gulf War veteran and their family scenario, not like the normal situation in the population where a number of these different infections occur. So that was part of the evidence that we acquired showing that uh, this was probably due to the experiments that were being conducted. And of course, there's uh, more anecdotal evidence than that. Uh, we know what was being done <clears throat> from the prison records. We know what the incidence of illness was from the prison records. And it was very high during the time when these experiments were being conducted. It was very low before and very low after. Um, we knew in the population that the illness was associated with individuals and families that had one member of the family working in the prison system. So that was a link. And in those families as well, they had this one infection, the mycoplasma fermentans. So there are no, there's a, quite a bit of anecdotal evidence uh, suggesting that uh, these infections came from the prison system. This was all covered up. Uh, the state actually did a so-called epidemiological study, which they avoided studying the prison at all. And they concentrated on the water system. And after a year or so of studying this, they came out with a declaration that the water system is safe. There's no infections in the, in the Trinity River, River, which is the main river that supplies the water system. There's no evidence that the uh, water system was compromised. Well, that wasn't the point. And a lot of the, the uh, residents of Huntsville uh, rose up and really were angry about the state because they absolutely refused to look at the prison as a source of, of the, the illnesses in the community. How do we pin down if these were actually weapons that were being tested? Well, there's one way you can do this, and that's using molecular biology and molecular genetics. Because to make a weapon out of a biologic source, you need to do a few things. You need to make it heat resistant, for example. So that's why if you deploy it in a scud, for example, or spray it on the sand, it has to be resistant to heat. How do you do this? Well, you insert thermal resistant genes. So you can take the thermal resistance genes, for example, from the Thermidopolis bacteria that live in volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean, and take those genes and put them in the organism and make it thermally resistant. So that's something that couldn't occur naturally. I mean, there's no contact between bacteria at the bottom of the ocean at 6,000 feet down and microorganisms that are floating around uh, here in Central North America. Resistance to drying. Uh, obviously, if you deploy a biologic weapon, it has to have uh, resistance to drying. And the way you do this with a microorganism is you put spore forming genes in it. So you give the capacity of the microorganism to create kind of a tough spore that is resistant to drying. Cellular entry, you've got to make it uh, penetrate into cells better to make it uh, more pathogenic. So you insert receptor genes to do that, and I'll show you the evidence that we have uh, that this happened. Cellular death, if you want to kill cells, you've got to insert toxin genes into the microorganism to produce toxins that will actually kill cells. You have to make sure that it will resist the immune system, so you insert immune suppression genes to suppress the immune system or to help it hide from the immune system. And you want it to grow rapidly so you insert growth genes. So these are some of the modifications that are done to weaponize a, an agent. What we stumbled across, it was all by accident, by the way, was the fact that the uh, military uh, personnel were being given uh, microorganisms that had a piece of the HIV gene. And this is why some of the soldiers that came back were false positive for HIV virus. They didn't have the HIV virus. They had the part of the envelope gene that was inserted into the mycoplasma. And so there were a lot of false positives among military personnel. And families were really upset about this, but they didn't have AIDS. They were showing no signs and symptoms of AIDS. 
So we think that uh, part of the HIV genome was placed in the mycoplasma to make it more pathogenic. Now here's what we found. And by the way, I haven't presented this before. We had all this data for years, but we were kind of hesitant to, to publish it. In fact, we were threatened if we published it, they'd kill us and so on. So I'm showing this publicly for the first time. That, that Gulf War illness patients, uh, we found that um, 60% of the mycoplasma positive patients had the HIV-1 envelope sequences. So we didn't find it in every patient, every Gulf War illness patient that was positive for mycoplasma. And I don't know the reason for that except that they were probably testing a number of different things with the vaccine. So there may have been some other sequences that we don't know about. To make HIV virus, you have to have all these genes, gag pole, envelope, rev, so on. Otherwise, you can't make an intact virus that's defective. So um, we knew that uh, they didn't have HIV. In fact, they had no evidence that they had HIV. They only had the small part of not even the complete envelope gene, but probably enough of it to, to produce a part of the GP120 complex. Now, in the Huntsville mystery disease patients, it was called mystery disease at the time because they didn't know what it was from the 1980s, now we found a completely different scenario. We found some that had the envelope gene, some that had another gene, the pole gene, the polymerase gene, some that had the rev gene, so on. So it looked like they were doing a lot of experiments in the prison system, putting in different genes, checking to see how uh, pathogenic they were and so on in the, in the people in the prison system. So this is evidence showing that what was going on in the 70s and 80s, experiments were taking place where we were trying different types of weaponization procedures, trying different countermeasures against uh, things like the mycoplasma, making these different uh, hybrids. When the Gulf War broke out, they'd settled on at least mycoplasma fermentans as one of the microorganisms that they wanted to test in a full-scale operation with the HIV-1 envelope gene, and that's why they, uh, we picked it up in that. Also, um, th these ladies and others found evidence for the transfer to the Iraqis of these modified microorganisms and also to Israel. I didn't mention that. The Israelis also had these and who knows where else they were sent as well. So let's go back to patients in general now. We're not talking about uh, uh, the Gulf War or the Huntsville patients and so on. Just talking in general about patients and their various types of infections and concentrating on the mycoplasmal infection is kind of a summary again, showing that uh, in the case of some diseases like Lyme disease and ALS, there's a very high incidence of mycoplasma. And I mentioned that the mitochondria, and this is a picture of an uh, artist's conception of a mitochondria inside the cell, the little batteries inside our cells that generate the energy that we all need and every cell needs. And the, the, uh, the mycoplasma attack these. So what, what have we done recently to try and circumvent the damage to the mitochondria? But I'm just gonna talk about what the mycoplasma does. I mentioned that it stimulates the release of these reactive oxygen species that damage the membrane. And we know what they do now. They damage the membrane by oxidizing the lipids and making the lipids unable to fit carefully uh, together. And Don mentioned the, this paper, the fluid mosaic membrane model that uh, we published in 1972. And this is kind of a classic paper. Matter of fact, Don, it was the most highly cited paper in all fields of science for 10 years going. And uh, one of the things that we found is if the lipids are damaged, they don't quite fit together as well in the membrane. And what this does is it leaves some gaps in the membrane and makes them transiently leaky. And then ions can slip through the membrane and these membranes are very carefully designed to maintain a polarity and maintain actually a chemical and electrical potential across the membrane. And if the membranes are leaking in any way, these things run down and their, their chemical potential runs down and the electrical potential across the membrane is short-circuited. So what happens is they lose their capacity to produce energy because that is tied to this membrane potential. If the mitochondria lose their membrane potential, they can't do oxidative phosphorylation. They can't make these high energy phosphate molecules that are necessary 
for our energy systems. One of the things that we've done, to make a long story short and try and end my topic, is to feed patients a food which is highly rich in lipids which are not modified, which are unoxidized, and protected so that they, they're not oxidized during their ingestion, during their transport, and so on. So this is what I've called lipid replacement therapy, and I've written whole reviews on this whole process and using this, for example, during cancer therapy, which is our most recent study and, uh, to help cancer patients uh, which have this problem during their therapy because their membranes are actually damaged by the therapy often, uh, to help chronically ill patients in general, autistic spectrum disorder patients, neurodegenerative patients, autoimmune patients, all these patients benefit, as it turns out, from this type of lipid replacement therapy. And the reason is that because all these patients have damaged lipid membranes. All these patients do. So this is pretty significant, and that means that this type of therapy is very useful. What does this amount to? Well, it amounts to taking some um, encapsulated lipids and antioxidants every day. Very simple. Essentially, it's a food. Why? Because the lipids we get from natural sources, we just protect them so they're not oxidized uh, during their metabolism and transport. And so it's a very simple thing to do. It's very natural. So uh, finally, I'm going to end up with uh, just a summary that the incidence of chronic intracellular infections is statistically related to various chronic illnesses versus controls. And I haven't really shown you the data on that. You'll have to accept our publications on, as evidence for that. One study that we did uh, on cancer patients showed that the patients that had a very uh, difficult form of cancer that could have a fatal outcome died more quickly and progressed more rapidly if they had these infections. And we know the reason for that is infections like the mycoplasma, for example, cause genetic change in cells. So they accelerate the genetic change that is already occurring in the cancer cells, and this increases the progression rate of the cancer cells. And actually, this Shai Ching Lo that I mentioned, who patented the mycoplasma fermentans, was one of the first people to show this in a study on, uh, strictly in a vitro study, but showing that cells progressed to cancerous uh, if you put in the mycoplasma, and he could put an antibiotic and treat those infected cultures and stop this from occurring. So we know that this is a problem. We also know that the illness onset is related to transmission of chronic infections. We proved that, I think, in the Gulf War veterans' family members. And uh, we think in the autistic spectrum disorder patients, the same thing is true, where we feel that there is a relationship, although it hasn't been clearly delineated between vaccines and illness. And the reason it's not so clearly delineated in the case of children with autistic spectrum disorders is number one, there, there's so many different vaccines that are involved. But one thing that uh, public health authorities have been using as a smokescreen to get parents to have their children vaccinated is the fact they say, well, there's no evidence that any vaccine is related to autism or autistic spectrum disorders. Well, well that's, that's probably true. Any one vaccine, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about multiple vaccines used uh, together, used often as a triad, like the, the MMR, for example, vaccine triad, and used in what I consider to be less than optimal vaccination schemes. In fact, not only suboptimal, uh, well, I won't use it, as just, let's just leave it at suboptimal. I don't want to commit myself to any more than that. We haven't really, I think, reached uh, any conclusion in the case of children with autistic spectrum disorders, but my guess is that it will be related to the multiple vaccines that they received, either because of immunosuppression of these young patients who don't have fully developed immune systems anyway, or to contaminants in the vaccines. Now, one of the papers that I often cite is the fact that when commercial vaccines are checked for contaminants. One of the contaminants that's found quite often in commercial vaccines is mycoplasma. In the vaccines? In the vaccines. Now, you might say, well, why don't they do something about this? Well, I just happened to 
by chance, take a flight somewhere, and I forgot where I was going. I was flying back to Washington for one reason or another. And I happened to be with a city next to a vaccine manufacturer who, who was really mad because he got bumped out of first class. So he was riding back there with the rest of us and complaining of blue streak and everything. And I you know, kind of asked him where he was going and he was going to the FDA and so on. So we got to started talking and I started telling him what we had found and he started getting more and more nervous as time went on. And so I flat out asked him, I said, well, I, I know that uh, you know about this problem and I want to flat out ask you, why don't you test these vaccines for mycoplasma? Because I think this is a potential problem. And his immediate knee-jerk response was, what are you trying to do, drive us out of business? I said, well, what do you mean drive you out of business? I mean, that's, that's a matter of safety. And he said, and then he started hedging and hawing and making up excuses and so on and so forth. And the fact of the matter is, is they don't want to test for these types of things because it's, it's expensive to test for these types of infections. And quite frankly, I think they're afraid of what they might find. So uh, th this is part of the whole problem of convincing authorities, convincing people that uh, we need to look into this uh, much more seriously. I just want to finally plug um, the book that my wife and I wrote, Project Daylily, where we discuss what happened uh, after the Gulf War, what happened in Texas with the prison system and the testing and so on, and what happened to us because of it. Um, we were forced to actually leave. Uh, I was an endowed full professor, department chairman at the University of Texas. Uh, and I literally had to, we literally had to leave for Texas because of, of uh, it was just became too dangerous. Several of my colleagues died. My boss was shot in the back of the head in his office and so on because he was going to blow the whistle on the prison testing experiment. So it became very dangerous. So that's the story that I wanted to leave you with. It's an ongoing story. It's not done. I have to thank our patients, particularly our military patients, for supplying a lot of the information, particularly some of the classified information, which I'm not supposed to really talk about. But uh, they have been our greatest source of uh, inspiration. And uh, this work was done for them. Thank you. patients are not treated, they don't recover. So they remain perpetually in chronic illness states. And this is what we've seen in our population. We've seen people become chronically ill and they're chronically ill for the rest of their lives. Now, the major pharmaceutical companies love this. Why do they love this? Well, for the next 20, 30 years or whatever, they have uh, people that are willing to buy their products, uh, which uh, for the most part are palliative, that is a can suppress the signs and symptoms, but they don't really go after the underlying problem. And again, they love that because that, that means they've got customers for life. So they're going to make billions and billions of dollars off of all these chronic illnesses.